Today's session is going to be run by me and Alessandro from now to about 11 o'clock. Um, the session is going to be split into two parts. First, I'm going to give you roughly about 20 minutes to 30 minutes talk going through the slides and then give you an introduction about this workflow, uh, which is CT2S. Um, and then for the rest of the session, you will get um, a chance to try part of the workflow. Um, it's not going to be the full workflow because one, it takes too long and two, um, there are certain interactions with the software that require additional training, which we can't really cover today. But hopefully that will give you a good idea of the CT2S workflow and how we use that to predict the risk of fractures. So first, I just want to introduce myself. So I'm Shannon, I'm from Sheffield, um, I'm a lecturer there, um, and I'm part of the Insignio Institute for In Silico Medicine. Um, so we are quite a large institute now, um, and all of the researchers there um, work in areas of In Silico Medicine, uh, including from computer simulations, gait analysis, all the way down to the cell and tissue level, and doing um, sort of um, in virtual work as well. So that's us, uh, Insignio. Um, so Alessandro is one of our very valuable assets in Insignio, and he's here to help me with the hands-on session later on. So the two of us will roam around, and any questions, just grab us. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that there are some issues with the two links that's being sent to you, which are the two software I ask you to download. So. ITK Snap is the one that's currently the website is down. Um, surprise, surprise, they should choose to have the website down on Valentine's Day and when I need to run this <laughs> workshop. Um, so apologies with that, because I checked on Monday, it was all working fine. Um, what I did instead is that mm -hmm. this morning, just now, I sent an email to all of you, if you could double check your mailbox. Um, it contains a link to some shared files. And in there, there is an ITK Snap uh, installation software, but it's for Mac only, because that's the only thing I can retrieve on my MacBook. Um, so if you have a Windows PC, unfortunately, you can't use the ITK Snap today. But the good news is, for the second piece of software, which is BoneMat, it's Windows only. So the Mac users can't use that one. So what I'm going to suggest is that I see a very nice combination of Mac and Windows. So if you somehow pair up between among yourselves, so you can share some Mac and share some PC, and each of you can do part of the exercise, so two exercises in total. Um, I do apologize for the inconvenience. I completely didn't foresee that coming through. I didn't get any notification from the developer either, so apologies for that. Um, however, I am going to go through the steps Pardon? Where does Linux go? Uh, uh, you may probably need to go sit with somebody else. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so I would suggest if you have a Linux um, platform, you find someone with a Windows or a Mac. Um, I am going to run through it kind of step by step and in the shared folder I sent you this morning you will find a document which um, actually goes through them step by step as well. So after the session if you do want to have a go with it yourself you should have all the information available there for you to go through the steps. Okay so any questions so far? Everybody happy? Okay. Um, so I'm going to start with my talk. So today I'm going to tell you a bit more about um, this computational modeling approach that we're using or developing in Sheffield, which is called CT2S. It's for predicting the rest of four, uh, primarily for elderly. Um, I know that you have gone through a lot of courses yesterday, which are primarily focused on HPC applications. Um, this is a slightly I guess, deviated topic from there. Um, the workflow is on HPC system, um, and it has been used on there. Um, however, it's mainly being used if you have got a very large image set. Um, but um, I'm going to demonstrate that this workflow here, so you will see less of an application to HPC in this section, but 
get more of a feel of sort of the biomedical engineering applications about how you can link different softwares and how HPC can come into play when you have a very large data set. So what I'm going to do first, why do we want to predict fractures in patients? Just to set the scene a bit. Um, what is the CT2S or CT2 strength pipeline? What does it do? And now I'll introduce you to the steps that's involved in the CT2S pipeline. Um, so there are different, a few different steps that you are required to reach a full computer model for your simulations. Um, hopefully that will create some fundamental understanding about the pipeline and then we can have discussion about various aspects of it, what can be improved, for example. Um, and at the end, you will get a chance to actually practice part of the pipeline. So the two parts you are going to do, or the two exercises, is segmentation, which uses ITK SNAP, um, and material property estima estimation, which uses BOMAT. So I'll go through the detail a bit later as well. Um, so first of all, can I have a show of hands of what kind of background are you guys coming from? Has, does anybody know about the structure of bone before? Okay, so I've got a good audience to start here. Um, so just a quick recap. The anatomy of bone, so it's got two components. Um, first one is what we call cortical bone. This is the stiff part of the bone, which is on the periphery of the structure. Typically, you're looking at a Young's modulus of 15 to 20 gigapascal in adults. Um, and then you've got the cancellus, or what we call the sponge bone. So the name came from a spongy structure, or trabecular structure, um, which looks quite different from your cortical bone. So the trabecular bone is a little bit softer, so we're looking at around 13 gigapascals in adults. Um, and the two types of bone, obviously, um, form all your lung bones and then other bone structures in the body. So that's all going very well until you start aging. Um, and then this is when your bone production starts to slow down and then they don't function as well as before. So one quite important issue that um, people usually look at is what we call osteoporosis. Um, and you will see the picture here. This is a normal bone structure, so that's the trabecular bone. Um, and when you have osteoporosis, so you've got more pores or more holes in your trabecular structure. And you can see here that the bone density has reduced compared to a normal bone. So obviously with less bone, it means your structure is less stiff and less stable. And that may cause problems. So for example, if elderly people tend to fall, and then when you fall, sometimes they'll fracture their bones. So the statistics shows that one in three women and one in men is likely to sustain some sort of fracture related to osteoporotic conditions. Um, so the statistics is slightly higher for women than for men for hormonal reasons. So a lot of the four um, populations we look at are actually elderly women um, because this is the population that's at more danger compared to the men. So that's the clinical background. So what do we mean by fracture um, or fracture of fall? Um, one very important class of fracture during a fall is the fracture to your hip or your femoral head. So in your thigh, there's one big bone, long bone called the femur. So that's the main bone that's supporting your weight from the upper body. And when your femur fractures, usually you are not being able to move for quite some time until it heals. So this will cause some quality of life issues, as well as after the bone has healed, you may not be able to function 100% compared to previously. So gradually, you might lose some bone muscle functions, and that's a big issue in elderly populations. So this is just a very colorful illustration of um, your proximal femur. So that's the very top part of your femur. 
And depending on the color-coded regions, if a fracture happened in a particular region, then the fracture is defined as a particular fracture. So for example, if you say a head fracture, that means the fracture happens in the purple region of the femur. Um, so there are different clinical ways of defining fractures, and usually they're defined in sort of four different types, depending on, again, which region um, the fracture has occurred. So what can we do as engineers to help clinicians to provide a more accurate diagnosis of fracture? So the current standard is to use what we call um, a DEXA scan, and then you can take a thin slice of image across the bone and look at the bone mineral density. And you can estimate the bone mineral density within a 2D cross-section or an area of that patient. Um, and combined with medical histories, so um, parameters such as if you're a smoker or not, how much exercise you do, do you take any other additional medicines, um, all these information combined together, currently the clinicians will give you an estimate of how likely you are going to fracture in the next few years. And if, you, if they think, yes, you are at high risk of fracture, they will probably prescribe you some drugs that will help sort of promote your bone growth and the equilibrium within your bone tissues. Um, this is working fairly okay at the moment, but it's not a perfect system. So the predictive accuracy they could reach is probably around 70%. Um, and the main thinking behind using a computer model is that if we could really bump up that predictive accuracy to around 80% or even 90%. So the idea is that instead of predicting a aerial uh, bone mineral density, if we use a CT scan to get a 3D volume of your entire femur. We've got the geometric information combined with your 3D volumetric density information. And would that give us a better estimate of if or how likely you are going to fracture a few years down the line? So this is the thinking about bone modeling at organ level. Um, so we are talking about a whole bone, and in this case, um, I'm showing a femur here, and this is the main target for the CT2 strength workflow as well. So all the examples I'm showing here today in the PowerPoint slide will be using the femur model, um, as you will see later, um, and I'll show you how we predict the risk of falling elderly. Um, for your second session, which is hands-on demo, because I'm not allowed to use clinical data uh, here, so um, I'm going to use an open source public data, um, which is a tibia bone. So that's the bone sort of um, in your leg. But hopefully that will show you a good demonstration of how the workflow works, because um, theoretically it's the same whatever long bone you are going to do. Any questions with the general background before I move on to the actual pipeline? Cancer, spongy bone. Yeah, the spongy part of it. Uh, yes. Do you actually test the ligament around the elbow, the alveoli, or, or the whole thing? Uh, we don't test the ligament because we can't see it on the CT. <coughs> it's for bone only. It's too fine. Uh, you need to do MRI for ligaments, okay. and they are more expensive. Um, and they're not, usually, they're not the standard of care in sort of elderly fracture cases. Um, in terms of your question about the Young's modulus estimation, so if you have got an organ scale level, if we are only focusing on organ scale, um, we estimate it based on your CT attenuations. And this is part of the wor workflow I'm going to show you. Um, however, we are running in parallel some other work where we have got micro CT data. And those data are very detailed in terms of the tissue scale <laughs> mechanical properties, and that we need to use a slightly different approach because the images are very high resolution. Um, and the third TA is that we 
it's in the same Cup Biomed um, project where we have some data from the diamond synchrotron. And these are even more detailed, uh, I think it's down to microns. Um, and those images are huge. Um, so Alessandro currently is running some tests to sort of just trying to transfer these images between sites for further analysis. So there's different tiers of mechanical property estimation you can do depending on your purpose, obviously. But there must be some uh, gauge measurement for, um, for you to be able to do the one-on-one uh, -on -one correspondence between uh, bone density and elastic uh, yield modulus. Or, or uh, how is it actually uh, initially measured? I mean, there must be something. There have been previous research where, so they've got donated long bones, and then people will take those bones. Well, they will do it. Yes. Um, and they will do a CT scan first, and then they will take out the bone, and then they will burn it to get what you call ash density, and then they will get the correlation between the two. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. So I'm moving on to, um, I'm going into detail about the pipeline now. Um, so the general CT2 strength pipeline um, developed at University of Sheffield. So this is primarily to be used to predict the risk of fracture. Uh, but saying that, this is a very generic workflow that you can use to model any sort of organs in the body. Um, so I have some other projects going on to model skeletal muscles, and we follow more or less the same procedure. Um, so usually we'll start with a set of patient-specific images. So these can be typically MRI or CT scans. Um, we will go through a segmentation process. Um, this is where you extract mm. the volume information of a specific organ you're interested in. So in this case, it's the femur. Um, once we've got the volume mesh, um, you go through a mesh meshing procedure to create your final element models. So again, a lot of software that you can use for that procedure. So ANSYS Arbacus are the two biggest commercial companies that provides FE packagings, and they all come with their own preferred sort of meshing software as well. Um, and the last part, as I mentioned before, is once we've got the mesh, we estimate our personalized mechanical property based on the CT attenuation. So this works for bone, um, but it doesn't really work for muscle because you can't see muscles on CT. They're not designed to show up on CT. So um, an MRI work on a different principle from CT. So what you do on CT doesn't really apply to MR. So what I'm going to show you today about Young's modulus estimation only apply to bone. Um, and once we've got a nice personalized model with um, personal geometry and personal material properties, um, we run some simulations using FE packages. So you can use any packages of your choice, really. Um, and we will usually apply a range of different loading to, say, mimic a certain physiological condition. So that could be a standing condition, like now, where you apply sort of a direct load acting on your femoral head. Um, or if you want to mimic some sort of loading, like a jump or a sta stair climbing, then you apply a certain angle to your loading so that the loading configuration is different and you get a different mechanical response of the femur as well. Um, and one very interesting case, which is currently sort of a quite um, heated, air, well not heated, but sort of a quite um, popular area to look at is what we call side fall. So this is when for elderly, if you have an accidental fall, it's a very complex procedure. So sometimes if you fall, the impact can be in any locations and you're not talking about a vertical force, sometimes they're actually sideways impact. Um, then, and that would involve quite a complex loading conditions to be applied to your bone to capsulate that whole spectrum of loadings. And this is where we use HPC systems sometimes to run a lot of different loading conditions on the same model to see the mechanical response and find out which loading condition is the most dangerous to that person. So that's the general idea of the workflow. Um, and here is a 
better looking schematic of the general steps. So everything always starts from image segmentation to get you a good geometry to start with. Um, and this is exercise one in your demo later. Um, and then the standard workflow goes from volume meshing to material property mapping, and you run your FE simulation to get your femur strength. Now on this side, you can see sort of a second set of alternatives, and it's because in some clinical CT scans, they don't scan the whole femur. So you only have the proximal part of the femur, which means you don't have any information about the distal end next to the knee joint. Um, this creates some problems in terms of alignments, because if you've got the whole femur, you know where it is relative to your body. Uh, but if you only have the top half of the femur, you don't really know how it aligns with your knee joint and your hip joints. So this is where we have been working with Auckland Bioengineering Institute um, because they have developed this bank of statistical model. Um, and what we do is that we fit our proximal femur to their bank of um, femoral models and try to find the best match to give us um, an approximate anatomical landmarking so that we can approximate the knee joint center for our models to give us a good reference system um, of the position of the femur. So I'm going to show sort of both approaches today in the next few slides. So first up, um, just a brief introduction about CT. CT stands for computed tomography. Um, nowadays, most new CT scanners coming up are all dual energy systems as well, which means it can actually emit two different types of um, energies, and that gives you additional contrast to see um, certain things like fatty tissues as well. So it's a sort of new and or a lot of development, development in this area as well. Um, so it enables 3D reconstruction um, of the different slides. Um, obviously useful to visualize bones and tumors traditionally, but as I said, the upcoming sort of new features allow you to visualize um, fatty tissues as well. So this is first step, image segmentation. Um, this is showing ITK SNAP. Um, we use that quite a lot, uh, especially with our students because it's open source software. Um, there are other commercial software you can get for that purpose as well. So Mimix, ScanIP are some of the software that you can get. Um, because you pay a premium for those and you get more functionalities, which allow you to speed up quite a lot as well. Um, but for illustration pros, uh, purpose, I'll just use ITK Snap here. Um, so it's got certain semi-automatic segmentation tools, um, but it still requires a fair amount of manual interaction. Most of the time, it's able to pick up a rough shape of the femur, as you can see here. But you will see sort of dips and holes and missing pixels as well. So this is where, after the automatic algorithm, um, an operator needs to go in and manually patch it up and make sure that the shape looks like what it is in the image. So I jumped ahead myself. So this is a screenshot of Mimix, a, a very similar sort of setup of how you would expect to see it in the Mimix system. Um, as I said, Mimix, because you pay a premium for that license, you actually get additional features like filtering and thresholding and more sophisticated functionalities that would allow you to do sort of additional things to speed up your procedure. So for example, you can um, actually sort of cre create a thresholding and then you can do the cortical bone first and then you can do your trabecular bone and you can combine them together in Mimix. Um, ITK Snap doesn't really have that function at the moment. So these are the general information about segmentation software. Um, second step, once you've got the information of your geometry is volume meshing. Um, so what we show, I'm showing here is um, what we do in ANSYS ISIM. 
Uh, again, you can use other software to do similar things as well. Um, so basically, the software will generate an FE mesh based on your geometry, and you can specify the mesh density that you would like to have. Um, so this is just to show you a few screenshots about how this is done in ISIM. Um, the most important value that you will need to select is what we call maximum element size. It can be called different things in different software, but that decides on how fine your mesh is in your computer models. So I won't bore you with all these changing parameters. Um, once we've got a nice mesh, um, in the CT2S workflow, we do an additional step. Um, we add some middle nodes to our tetrahedral mesh to increase the accuracy of our FE simulations. Um, so this is a standard approach in the workflow, but if you are doing it yourself, it's up to you whether you want to do it or not. It's yeah. purely elastic mold for the material? Um, yes and no. So the one I'm showing you is elastic, but you can have plastic material properties, um, not with the bone map software. And you will need an FE solver with um, built-in plasticity. But the bone is considered not to be completely elastic? Not for this application, okay. because um, for sudden force, usually it's an elastic response. Um, if you have got some very extreme loading conditions, then you will start to consider plasticities because um, this, this is when some of the bone tissue will start to yield. Uh, but usually with a sudden impact, it's more elastic response. Okay, so material mapping, um, this is the bone mat software, a screenshot of that. So. Basically, once you have got your FE mesh, you load up your FE mesh um, and you load up your um, CT images um, together. Um, make sure that they're overlapping each other, which is what we're showing here. So you've got the CT in the background and you've got the FE femur sitting nicely on top of the uh, CT DICOM images. Um, and the software will estimate the Young's modulus um, of your personalized model based on your attenuations in the CT scan. So if you look, so zooming to the CT scan, you will see that inside the bone there's different shades of gray. So the more white of the color means the more stiff the bone is, and the more gray means it's softer. So typically in a CT scan, soft tissues are all dark gray and black color. Um, and this is the value that we use to base on and estimate our Young's modulus. Um, if you're interested in sort of the whole procedure about how you convert attenuation level to Young's modulus, um, there's a paper reference here by Teddy um, in the Bologna group. So they've done a whole range of experiments previously on cadaver bones to get the different parameters needed to convert these density values. Okay, um, so this is again a screenshot of bone mat just to show you how um, before you estimate mechanical properties you need to make sure you've got a good alignment between your FE mesh and your CT scan um, because otherwise you will be estimating material properties based on an area of CT scan which is not representing your bone. So this is quite important to double check before you click the button and say, give me my Young's modulus. Um, one quite nice feature in BoneMat is that it allows you to display the parameters afterwards, so after the fitting has completed. Um, and what you will see here is sort of a spectrum of different Young's modulus values within your femur model. Uh, usually the red color represents uh, very stiff materials, so we're talking about 15 gigabytes and above. Um, and blue color represents the other end of the spectrum, so these are usually soft, sort of the softer bones, so we're talking about one or two gigabytes. Um, typically you will see cortical bone on the periphery, um, however on the surface of the bone sometimes you will also see some quite soft patches because 
during segmentation, you inevitably contain elements, um, get elements that contain both a bit of soft tissue and a bit of bone. It's just to do with your voxel size. Um, so this is why when you look at your Young's modulus estimation, you might see some soft, softer mechanical properties on the surface. That's because you have included some of the soft tissues during your discretization as well. Excuse me, this, this model is a surface um, uh, that, that, uh, it, it looks like it's a, it's a surface mesh, but it's a volume. It's a volume mesh. Volumetric model. Yes. So if you see bone mat later on, you could actually, if you turn it, you can see that it's a solid volume. Um, I don't think you can do a slice through in bone mat yet, but if you use other finite element packages like ANSYS or Abacus, it will let you, allow you to show the spectrum of material property as well. And this is when you can actually slice through and see internally how it looks like, the distribution. But usually, even if you take a slice, you will see two strips that are very stiff, which represent your cortical bones on the surface. And then internally, because it's the, um, your bone, bone marrow, so it's very, very uh, soft, usually about two, 300 megapascal. Um, but I need to take, say that because the conversion between your CT density to Young's modulus is based on a stiff material, what we are estimating for bone marrow is probably not accurate because bone marrow is not a cortical bone or cancerous <coughs> bone. Um, but because it's very soft to start with, overall it doesn't really make that much difference when you do a mechanic. Yes, exactly. Okay, I mentioned about statistical shape modeling. I'm just to going to go through this very quickly. Um, it's an additional step we do when we only have the proximal geometry of the femur. Um, obviously, if the coordinate system or alignment is not that significant in terms of your application, you don't have to do that step. But in our application, because we want to have an accurate model of the different four scenarios, so it's quite important that we ensure we align it the same every single time for every single patient. Um, so the whole femur is estimated using a statistical shape modeling approach and there's a bank um, down in Auckland which we use to do this approach. Um, so we'll do some rigid registration um, to align the yellow femur with the red one. So the yellow one is a patient specific and the red one is a target femur. Um, and then that will provide us with a sort of good alignment between the two. Um, and once you have got that done, uh, we do some PCA, so principal component analysis, uh, that will allow us to adjust the database to give us an average representation of that proximal femur in the imaginary population. Um, so in a way, this is using a virtual patient approach where we have got a database of virtual patient. We know that is representative of that age range and we've got a new patient coming through with a partial femur, we want to get a good estimate of how it would look like in a population, basically. So that's the approach that we take. So we end up with an estimated whole femur model. You will notice that the green part at the top is the proximal femur information we have got from our clinical partner. And the red femur is the estimated femur based on that proximal uh, geometry using the st statistical database. And that will give us the knee joint center and the epicondyl points where we can then use them to define our local reference system to run the FE simulations. Yeah. How the knee, how the knee joint center is calculated? Um, to be honest, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I will need to ask um, how exactly, but I think it's to do with if you've got the count offs, then you can somehow estimate it. I think they take a slice and then take the midpoint, something like that. But if you're interested, I can ask. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is just very briefly um, because to create local reference system, you need to do some anatomical landmarking. 
And again, there are different software that allow you to do that. Um, and here we did it in Mimics. Um, because for the next step, we need to apply some different types of loading conditions to that femur. Um, and there are different approaches in the literature. So you would have seen um, some people doing contact mechanics. So you will have a contact surface with the femoral head, and then you're trying to see what sort of contact pressure is acting on it. Uh, we did some investigation to compare between a contact mechanics um, and say a distributed force and a point force. We actually didn't find that much difference. And given the computational sort of um, resource required for contact mechanics, so we just use a simple point force um, acting on the center of the femoral head. Um, so this is just to showing you the approach that we take to estimate the center of the femoral head. Um, it's a fairly crude approach, but we can get it done quite accurately. Uh, because it's a ball, so we basically fit a sphere to it, and the center of the sphere will be the center of your femoral head. And this is where we uh, apply our force or loading conditions to it. So once we've got the center of the femoral head, we've got the knee joint center and the two condyles, we can now define a 3D local coordinate system that is unique but consistent to every single femur, depending on their anatomical features. Okay, final element. Um, so that's the final step where we try to simulate a whole spectrum of different loading conditions on the femur to see how it responds mechanically. So to do that, we look at the stress-strain distribution in the femur and see if we can identify any islands of high stress and strain areas. Um, this is, um, the figure is showing from the ANSYS, so the graphics is not very good because we use APDL and the GUI is like 50 years old. Um, so this is showing you again the proximal femur mesh, but we know where approximately the knee joint center is from our statistical modeling. So we've got that information. Um, and we apply some boundary condition to it. Um, usually people would fix, say, the knee joint center in a few degrees of freedom and then apply a force on the proximal end or the femoral head end. Um, it depends on what type of loading condition you are looking at. So if you want to simulate a side fall or simulate a normal walking condition, then the type of boundary condition you apply may be slightly different just to reflect the boundary condition that's being experienced in that bone. Um, the approach we took is that um, we applied a range of different loading conditions in a corn shape. Um, so we've got a range of different angles in anterior, posterior, medial, lateral directions um, that would hopefully capture all the multiple stance conditions and the side for loading scenarios as well. Um, so we apply those loading conditions and we look at the, the stress and strain output of your femoral head. Um, so this is the first maximum first principle strain um, distribution and usually you would see some sort of high strain, strain area uh, within the femoral neck, neck for example. So that's indicating that you could have a neck fracture if this is a loading condition that's going to happen. Um, I haven't shown them here, but sometimes you will see high strains in the trochanter area as well. So that's an indication that for that specific patient, maybe the trochanter is the weak spot and it's going to fracture in that location. So that correlates quite nicely with the different, uh, four different types of clinically defined fracture locations that I showed you in the beginning of the talk. Um, again, there's a whole volume of le uh, literature that you can look into. People do different types of loading conditions and simulations to, um, but more or less to try to predict fracture more accurately for elderly patients. Okay, so to sum up, um, that's the not too long workflow for the CT2S. Uh, you would probably see that there are quite a bit of manual manipulations in between. Depends on your quality of the input data set and what you are trying to achieve at the end. Um, we are envisaging this as a clinical service sometime in the future. 
Um, so how this works would be that a clinician will submit a CT scan um, to the CT2S service and we actually created a mock-up um, sort of service page on our website. Um, and then an operator will run this through the CT2S pipeline. We estimated a cost about 80, 80 pounds, so 80 euro, I guess. Um, it will be a semi-automatic procedure, so we can automate some of those, um, but we do need a certain degree of manual interaction to make sure that certain things happen according to the plan and quality check what has been done. Um, at the end, we will generate a report which will be sent back to the clinician. That could be an email report with a PDF attachment which contains the essential femoral strength information of that patient and the risk of fall. So this additional, more quantitative information can then be combined with the current clinical considerations. So the patient's medical history and aerial BMD measurements. And then the clinician can make a judgment of how likely that patient is going to fall. Um, we did do a preliminary study on about 98 patients. That's a retrospective cohort. Um, and we got a predictive accuracy up to about 80, I think, almost 80 percent. So we are looking at um, quite a substantial increase from the current approach. Um, but we're looking at doing a larger cohort to further sort of ascertain what we have seen in that 100 cases. So that's CT2S in nutshell. Um, before I move on to the demo, I would like to acknowledge the cert these people who have contributed quite significantly to that workflow in the previous years. And any questions before I move on to the nitty gritty of the demo? Yes. Uh, there have been studies looking at like ligaments surrounding the femur and because um, I think there are certain reports to say that they help stabilize your femur bone and obviously during uh, impact your soft tissue would absorb mm -hmm. some of those forces uh, but no we haven't looked into it uh, using this approach mm -hmm. we are looking at it in a different approach which is a more statistical approach um, so we're looking at like an inverse pendulum model like you would do for body level mechanics um, and trying to approach it using a statistical analysis to say how likely it is um, for the soft tissue to have an impact. Uh, but I know there are studies looking into not the whole hip but probably some of the ligaments surrounding the femoral head. Yeah. Again, the computational cost probably wouldn't allow a whole hip to be included there. Yeah. Yes, it's um, generic. It, it, it is generic, the one I showed you. Uh, but in the Multi-SIM project, which I acknowledged just now, we are looking at patient-specific because um, we managed to recruit some patients and we've got MRI, CT, and plus gate data. So those will be patient-specific loading conditions. And no muscle panel forces are applied. So only electron forces on the other femur. So no forces applied by the muscles. No, there's no muscle forces. Um, we did explore that area actually um, to look at, because one thing we think is that how do we link between the gate data and sort of the femur data? Um, we think we can get some data from the gate, say from your ground reaction force, you can estimate your muscle force on a single bone and you can then apply that force to your femur. Uh, but we're having a bit of problem with how they calculate moments in open sim, because the moments are not balanced, which means you are starting with an imbalanced system. <laughs> so we're currently trying to figure out what is going on behind the scene, basically. Yeah, it, it, it is something that uh, occurs in every biomechanical modeling. Um, 
if you study the gait of people walking, yeah. mechanically speaking, or biomechanically speaking, it's the same. It's very difficult to balance movements mm. because we lack information, um, basically. Yeah. There are things we cut cor where we cut, cut corners. That's where you should. Or, of course, yeah. But I, I mean, because when we looked at different gait cycles, I can't remember the exact um, cycle. I think the beginning of the cycle was okay. You get a slight deviation of moment, which is expected. It's just within the numerical error range. Uh, but sort of within the mid-cycle, we get quite a big imbalance of moment, which is, I can't, can't remember, a few hundred newtons or something like that, which if you apply to FE model, it's going to have a significant impact. So we can't directly use that. But we're still trying to figure out what's another, another method or another way out. OK, anything else? OK. I shall move on, because I think you are getting coffee sometime before 11. So I think I need to make sure you get your coffee. Um, so the next step is the demo. So um, there are two exercises. and. Have you guys all received an email that contains a link um, for you to click on and then it will take you to a few files? Have you got that? Yeah. So in that Google Drive, there is a Word document called demo.doc, something like that. And if you open that, it contains a step-by-step -step, uh, introduction about what you need to do for the two exercises. So, there are two software you need to use. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I do apologize for the inconvenience. So the image segmentation one you need to use is ITK Snap. Um, in the same folder, you will find, um, I think there's a file for you to install that in Mac. So if you have a Mac, lucky you, you can try to install that. Otherwise, I think the ITK Snap website should be up and running in a few days. So you can try to go and download a version from there. They do have different versions to support Linux, Mac, and Windows users. So that's a bonus. Um, but if you can't manage to get it done, don't worry. I'm going to show you a quick demo on my Mac. So you will see what I mean and sort of the different buttons you need to click, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so this is the first part with image segmentation. With material mapping, um, it's the bone map software that you need to use. That one, at the moment, only supports Windows. So if you've got a Windows laptop, you can try that second part of the exercise. Um, if not, feel free to go home. And if you've got a workstation somewhere with Windows, you can download it and then try to have a play around, but probably not today. 